and gentlemen, demigods of all ages, welcome to a brand new episode of the Channel Chasers Podcast. I'm, of course, your host, Camp Director Jay, and joining me, as always, are my two co-directors, Brian and Tony. Tony is only limited to Diet Coke for the recording of this episode. God damn it. So, no hey, people. Okay. But yes, go ahead, I Brian. Just wanna... Hello, people. Welcome to Camp Afterlife. We're here to uh, talk about the new season. Just came out, like, literally just came out. Literally, yeah, we are literally recording this on the day of the uh, drop of the finale, which is something we don't normally do. But because February just decided to be super packed, we had to make some uh, we had to make some uh, interesting decisions in terms of our recording schedule. So also, uh, just a hint behind the curtain: this is a busy week for us IRL. Yes, it is. It is indeed. So, uh, yeah. we'll, we'll get to that. We'll get to that towards the end. But yes, Brian is correct. We are here. To talk about Percy Jackson and the Olympians, the brand new Disney Plus series based on the beloved Percy Jackson and the Olympians novel series. Man, yeah. uh, so to continue the tradition of the podcast, this is, you know, yet again, another one of the shows that we reacted to, like, trailers of as they were dropping. But, like, you know, as we mentioned in earlier episodes of the podcast, this was a foregone conclusion because I am a Percy Jackson super fan. And- I am a middle. So, like, I, I was going to cover this regardless, whether it was good, great, bad, or worse than the movie. But it could. There's no way in hell it could be worse than the movie. Um, we'll, well get. We'll get to that. You you could get the second. That's true. That the second movie does exist. I forgot. Uh, but yeah, uh, we'll get to that soon. Uh, it's gonna be a fun discussion, <laughs> full of comparisons, gushing about how much they got right, some of the smart changes, some of the great casting. But before all that, obviously, we can't talk an episode of the podcast without first jumping right into the news with Brian. All right, people. So behind the curtains a little bit, I was going to end up, it's been a slow week, so I was going to end up doing a thing where I uh, do set posts, which I usually don't like to do because most of you probably know us for audio, especially now that we're switched formats to uh, this for YouTube. But then last minute, as of day of recording, big news story hit that just came out of nowhere. And yet again, thanks to uh, James Gunn. We now know our Supergirl for the Gunniverse. Oh, shit. Oh, yes. Millie mm. Alcott. <gasps> yes. Oh, exactly. shit. Oh, yes. shit. It's young I didn't know Ra- that. Young Rhaenyra is gonna be no. is gonna be Kara. Holy yeah. shit, dude, Brian! Mm-hmm. I I did not expect you to pick this for the news story, but I heard about this and I'm like, let's go. All I'm saying is, all right, th- th- this is this is this is time number this is time number two. All right, you can get it right this time, DC. Say her name correctly. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, it's also a James Gunn running things, so hopefully. I hope so. Look, the CW has tainted people's perception of the pronunciation of her name. If you actually pay attention to how Kryptonian is structured or Kryptonese is structured as a language, it should be Kara. Mm-hmm. In every and, other uh, animated series, she has been called Kara. If you watch the animated movies that feature her in it, her name is Kara. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And uh, fun fact about about, um, Millie being casted. Uh, Gunn, when he was, uh, way back when season one of House of the Dragon was coming out, he texted, uh, Peter, uh, what's his name? Shit. Uh, Peter Saffron? Peter Saffron. He texted Peter Saffron saying, this is the kind of girl that I want for Supergirl. Nice. And they, di- they didn't reach out to her, but then she came in and not only did she audition, but apparently she did a spectacular audition. Amazing. Is audition. I mean, she is a very talented. Seriously. Very talented. Like mm-hmm. she, she killed it. Both her and the actor, the young lady who did younger Allison. Oh, they both mm-hmm. of them did an amazing job. But yeah, that's exciting. I'm super hyped for this because we know for a fact that uh, Millie can handle both the happiness and the tragedy drama. Yep. I I, I also wonder if they're also going to give her a a low-key female love interest that everybody totally knew that they were a thing. Mm -hmm. Come on. Come on. Y'all saw it. Like, I'm speaking more to the audience. Come on. Y'all saw that first episode. Mm -hmm. Y'all saw Mm -hmm. when they were reading. They were Mm -hmm. were more than just best friends. Mm -hmm. They were... History will say that they were best friends. History will say that they were roommates. Yes. Uh, still love that quote. Okay, Shut up, Siri. 
<laughs> Shut up, Siri. I wasn't talking to you. Oh, you said history and... She was like, did you say my name? No, shut up, Siri. <laughs> Anyways, keep that in, though, Tony. That was funny. Uh, I, I'm, yeah. But, yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, I saw cover it since we've been covering the, uh, what I'm calling the gunverse. Oh, uh, yeah, until it has an official title, it's the gunverse. The gun show. And, I'm, uh, I'm calling it the gun show. So, apparently, she, she is not only scheduled to be in the Supergirl movie, but it is said that she will make an appearance beforehand. Nice. In a different property. Ooh. I like the people vagueness. Are, people are speculating that it might be legacy. I think it could be a post cred. I could totally see it as a legacy post cred. Yeah. You know what I, you know what I would love to see? I would love hmm. to see her Supergirl movie be an interpretation of uh Batman Superman Apocalypse. If you remember that animated hmm. film that introduced post crisis Supergirl. Well, all we know about her movie so far is that it is currently titled Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow. And Oh yeah, yeah. I oh yeah, I know that much. Uh, it is being written by... Is it written by Tom King? The, I hope no, it's written by Tom uh, King. It's written by one of the uh, leads for, I think it was uh, True Blood. Oh. I, well, no, uh, Vampire Diaries. The the, uh, re the, re the reason I say Tom King is because Tom King is the original writer for Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow. And, uh, you know, if it actually does take some cues from Supergirl Woman of Tomorrow, uh, I think the movie's going to be amazing. Because uh, for those of you guys who haven't read the uh, the miniseries, it basically is a series. It, it's a like spacefaring journey where like Supergirl helps out a, uh, a girl who is uh, dealing with some um, major problems on her planet. And uh the major kind of like B plot for it is Supergirl dealing with the survivor's guilt of mm. actually surviving Krypton's explosion because Cal was a baby. Supergirl was 13. Mm. Because remember, like she was sent off at the same time as Cal, but she gets stuck in a wormhole, which like jettisons her out decades after because she was supposed to be sent at the same time as Cal to protect and watch after Cal. So okay. it's her dealing with all that baggage, like feeling like she's a failure because like like, well, I was supposed to look out for Cal, and, you know, here I am showing up 15 years too late, and now he's, like, you know, Mr. Big Bad Superhero. I'm excited for it. Well, um, I just googled it, and the writer is, uh, is, uh, Anne Noguera. Uh, she played, uh, she played Penny in, uh, Vampire Diaries. Oh, cool. And that's all we really know about it so far, so time will tell. Yeah, I'm excited. I hope that DC doesn't do what Marvel does, because I hate what Marvel does. Marvel takes the name of established icon stories and doesn't use any of the plot except mm -hmm. for maybe one or two well based on that like promo video that gun did it seems like he is a big fan of the comics so yeah i mean you could tell you could tell that with even if, even going back to his marvel work you could tell that with his guardian stuff mm -hmm. but yeah so you know i'm very excited and you know like we yeah. mentioned in our year and wrap up like we loved shazam so i think gun and peter saffron together as a creative duo running the show is going to be great yeah but we're we are going to have to wait because the first live action that we get from their universe will be Superman. And that one is going to be next year. And the first ever like DCU Gunverse thing that we are getting is going to be later this year with Creature Command. Yep. Very excited. But very much worth the wait. For sure. So. Mm -hmm. Definitely. But for now, talk about more recent stuff. All right. So with the news out of the way, it is that time once again. It is Screen screen time screen time for those of you new to the podcast is the segment of the podcast where we talk about the various bits of media we have been consuming in between podcast episodes that can range from comics to books tv shows we don't have time to cover movies we don't have time to cover youtube series other various things music and so much more so i'm gonna start us off i didn't really have much uh tony pointed me in the direction of a very awesome uh youtube series by a channel called colin the bat it is a disney villains retrospective where he goes through chronologically talking about all the various different Disney villains from the classic Disney shorts to the Silly Symphony cartoons to all of that all the way up to the theatrical movies and so far the latest episode he has is on everybody's favorite maniacal rat Professor Radigan mm. like one of my personal favorite uh, di uh, underrated Disney villains the great mouse detective is awesome um, but yep. th the series itself is very very fascinating it goes into a lot of the depth of the characters into their creation what their original characterization was like the evolution of said characterization and their various different appearances um mm -hmm. uh, one of the cool things is i learned a lot more about 
Pete and just how important Pete is to the Disney villain mythos. Uh, he was yep. one of the early episodes and it was very interesting. One of my favorite things, Brian, and you'll get a kick out of this, is that a lot of times in the episodes for the Disney villain retrospective, when he's talking about the different appearances in various media, he's like, mm -hmm. yes, they appear they also appeared in Once Upon a Time. And he's just clearly mm -hmm. reading from the wiki. He's like, guys, guys, look, I'm getting my info from the wiki and my sister because I heard Once Upon a Time was great, especially the first three seasons. Seasons, but it is way too in-depth for me to just tackle in a small section of these videos. Oh yeah, indeed. Because like I said, uh, I've been telling you guys about a, a creator that has been doing a retrospective like review of Once Upon a Time, and each season is three plus hours. Yep, so that was fun. I've also been uh, really deep diving into Professor Thorgy's uh, side channel, Thorgy's Arcade, and all mm. his all his different uh, fighting game retrospectives. He did a really good one on blaze blue and the insane lore of blaze blue uh which leads me into another thing uh because tekken 8 is out and i don't have tekken 8 yet i've been in a really big fighting game mood so i've been playing street fighter 6 again and i actually convinced tony to reinstall the game and we uh we dusted up for a little bit tony you want to give some commentary about uh what our matches were like all right folks listen listen i'm the kind of person that plays defensively and when i tell you that majority of the time that this man one he did but i didn't give him an opening to actually beat me into a bloody pulp oh no it wasn't e me. it wasn't easy it was like oh, unstoopable for it was like unstoppable force meets immovable object because i'm a rushdown player so you know my entire strategy when playing fighting games is quick long combos and tony did his damnedest to cut off my combos at the knee at every turn because because of, of all I'm, that damn armor mm -hmm. and i was in a rhythm too we got to some really intense matches folks like i I wish I could save the replays because like it was intense. There was one in particular where like we were each down to a slither a sliver of health and Tony just let up his defense for like half a second. I slid under him and did the sickest combo of my entire life. It yeah. was beautiful. Right. These fights were so good. I needed a nap. Yeah, no, it was it was awesome. Uh shout out uh it it, re it really kind of uh, put me back into the group for fighting games, which has me super excited for Tekken 8. Hopefully, uh, by the recording of next episode, I'll get to let you guys know how Tekken 8 is. It seems like I've been a fighting cor fighting game correspondent for this podcast for a couple games now with MK1, Street Fighter, and soon Tekken. I'm very excited for Tekken because Tekken was my shit back in the arcade games, uh, arcade days. I spent so many quarters at the Tekken machine with my friend Donovan uh, looking forward to playing Tekken 8. Donovan's already got Tekken 8. I'm excited. It's going to feel like the old days. Uh, but yeah, that, that's pretty much it. I also checked out the uh, first episode of Griselda, the Netflix uh, series about Griselda Blanco, La Madrina, the godmother. And it's amazing. Sofia Vergara is unrecognizable. She is Griselda. Like, it's amazing. Very well done. Very well acted. I, I'm i excited to watch the other five episodes. Uh, we had to bump it due to the fact that like February is super packed. But I'm definitely going to talk about it it because this show is really fucking good nice if you like shows like narcos from netflix you'll love this it has nice. a, like a true crime dramatization type vibe similar to like stuff like american crime story and things like that it's awesome it's awesome and uh we were joking around off camera so like the Grise the the blanc uh, the blanco family right is or in particular uh Griselda's oldest son is pissed at netflix uh for this series but my personal theory is after seeing the first episode he's pissed at the i think he's pissed at the series because it's highlighting the ruthless and just straight up savagery that his mother was capable of and not the positive you know good for the community that you know the family wants to be known for but let's be real she's known for being the leader of one of the strongest drug cartels in history mm -hmm. her name is her nickname is the godmother but it 
it ain't pretty. Though the, the, there's there's some blood on that magic wand. Lots and lots of blood. Oh yeah. So like it makes sense that he's upset about it. It's not in the. I don't think it's the same vein of upset as like how the Dahmer victims were upset with the betrayal of their relatives in Dahmer, because that's understandable. But this, I think he's just mad because it makes his mama look, you know, fucked up because she does a lot of fucked up shit. And she did do a lot of fucked up shit. But yeah, go watch Griselda. Uh, that's pretty much it for me. So moving on, we're gonna we're gonna switch things up a little bit and go to Tony first. Tony, mm. what uh what be, uh, what bits of media do you want to talk about? Uh, I know that there is one thing uh that that uh, you know we all watched with you. Oh, that would be a uh, hell of a boss. That was very excellent. I have enjoyed going on this big old train wreck of relationship dynamics, toxic work environments, and also wholesomeness. Questioning your own parenting ability and wholesomeness. Don't forget wholesomeness. It's very wholesome. And uh, hint, hint, this may not be the last time we talk about the Hellverse, people. Mm-hmm. Excellent stuff. All right. Uh, oh. oh, also. Uh-huh. Go ahead. I'll keep quick and snappy because, well, we're on a bit of a uh, crunch, so to speak. So there's this anime called uh, Seven Luth Reincarnation, which basically it's a romance anime about a girl who has lived six previous lives only to be killed in a war by, a, by an emperor. But the seventh life is different because he proposes to her. I've heard and of this one. It's actually really good. It's nice. very good. Solid. Nice. I've enjoyed it. Is it high dive? They... Crunchyroll? What's up? Where is that? Nice. It's actually a part of the queue if you want to check it out. Cool. Will do. Yeah, there are four episodes out at the moment. Still, such an interesting little story. I enjoy it immensely. Nice. Mm. Oh, uh, before you continue, one quick thing that I want to mention that we also watched, like, as part of the homie queue. Uh, we checked out Monster 103 Dragon Damnation, the anime oh. adaptation of the uh, one shot that was the prototype for One Piece. Mm. <laughs> so, what did you guys think about it? I really like seeing interesting, real interesting concepts that uh, yeah. Oda put together for this little story. And also, never trust a man with a mustache like that. It doesn't bode well for you. Never. And I, I yeah, it's a mm -hmm. it's a simplistic story, but the way they tell it is really cool and homey. Oh my god! And I I love seeing all the the frameworks of characters that you uh, you know you'll see later. Like you know we get Flair, who is a proto Nami. Ryuma is clearly proto Zoro, but with a little bit of Luffy mixed in there, personality wise. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, you know we see proto Mihawk, proto Moria, all this other stuff. And I love the thing that made me Mick fucking lose it as a One Piece fan. I love how they tie it into actual canon. Mm -hmm. It was fucking beautiful. Loved it. Great job, Netflix. Mm -hmm. But yeah, uh, so Tony, you have anything else or do we want to move on to Brian? That I... I pretty much have everything. You can go ahead, Brian. Okay, so, um, I thought that I didn't have that much, but, uh, I think I've got the most to talk about out of this group. Okay. Uh, first of all, I, uh, The Irrational is finally back. Nice. It took a big, long mid-season break for no reason. My guess is maybe the, uh... Rider Strike? Yeah. Yeah, makes sense. But, uh, it came back with a bang, because, uh, this episode involves, um, an arson case where a guy accidentally died and uh the uh two things that um were like the psychological things that were going on with this episode mm -hmm. was uh there was a little bit of uh of a whatchamacallit the phenomenon where you kind of make something up in your head because what you witness is beyond explanation oh yeah, yeah i know what you're talking about and, but the biggest one the biggest thing that they addressed here was just trauma and like dealing with trauma because since this case involves arson and possibly a serial arsonist. It brings up flashbacks to our main guy because if you remember when I told you before, Jesse L. Martin, his character is a survivor of a bombing mm -hmm. and was burned badly to the fact where uh, Jesse actually wears a prosthetic on his face for the show. Ah, cool. To represent the burns. And uh, so he has to live through his trauma and help somebody else who's starting their post-burn uh, healing. Um, so that was pretty cool. And then um, I watched NCIS uh, Sydney. Uh, there were two episodes left that were for the rest of the season. I do really hope it gets a second season. The first episode that I watched, and I'm going to tell you the episode titles because I think you'll get a kick out of it, Jay. Okay. Uh, this one was about uh, the female, the female uh, 
main cast members, which include the techie going out for the field for the first time, go to this, like, fancy party and, like, accidentally get trapped in the bunker. Huh. And so now it's up to them inside to try to figure out a possible way to get out and what's going on so they can try to stop it. Meanwhile, the male cast members are trying to figure out what's going on and the old, like, boomer-aged medical guy is the one who's trying to fill the techie's role even though he's very tech illiterate. Ah. <laughs> uh, the episode time I, I for had this? To, I had to deal with someone's tech illiteracy today, didn't I, Tony? Nice. Mm -hmm. I mean, but that's a common thing. Fair. Really. But, so, uh, but folks, bad at tech. That's me. Yep. He doesn't know how but QR codes you... work, people. It was frustrating. Oof, oof. But I told you that this took place in a bunker. Uh -huh. The name of the episode, Bunker Down. Huh, nice. And then um, the season-long plot actually comes into play at the finale, because there was a season-long plot mm -hmm. that actually started in the pilot, which was really cool. Cool. But uh, part of this fallout of it is the, the lead Australian dude who is blonde, his uh, son gets kidnapped. And so it's like a race to try to find his son and all that. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, trying to like solve the overall plot and what's going on with that. It's really cool. And uh, the reason why I said that he was blonde is because the name of the finale is uh, Blonde Ambition. <laughs> Nice. But uh, I also just watched more of Young Sheldon because it's good turn off your brain type stuff. Mm -hmm. Everyone's great in it. It still kind of blows my mind that uh, Mima Annie Potts was also uh, in uh, Ghostbusters. Yeah. When you told me she was Janine, I was like, holy shit. That's crazy. Yeah, but I got into getting into season two, so get into some more serious stuff. Like um, one episode where uh, off screen they find out that uh, a 16 year old they knew uh, passed away due to a car accident. And so that causes the really uber religious mother to question things. Mm -hmm. Because like she said in her own words, she was going to write a card saying that she's in a better place. But what better place would she be in than with her family and in her mom's arms and yeah. so yeah deal with that serious stuff but in the end it's they still managed to bring it around to being wholesome yeah and it doesn't it doesn't it, it does a good job it's like you know still like be being like a sweet family show but also tackling serious topics very well mm -hmm. and uh lastly just throw out a shout out it's something that i meant to mention before but i forgot to um i mentioned it before but a podcast called the uh, dead ghost productions they had their first art season of game and it was uh called replay and it's a ttrpg thing where um it's got like if you know the ttrpg space like the deep cuts like not like the obvious ones like critical role and all that but if you know like the deep cut podcast ttrpgs it's got some of the all-stars from that and they're playing die rpg which is uh self-described as kind of like goth jumanji nice where where uh the uh quote-unquote player type is called the the like god keeper or something like that but basically when the main uh chick who was playing her character described her character it was basically uh one of the race that pinhead is Oh, shit. Yeah, and it gets really dark and deep. Um, And the way that her class works is every time the god grants you a favor, you then owe the god thing. In so it's a tit-for-tat type situation. Makes sense. Kind of like how you would expect, in theory, warlocks to work in D&D. &D. But anyway, uh, then there's like the emotion night where you can literally, whatever emotion you are, you can actually at one point just completely cut that emotion out of a person so that they never feel that. That emotion ever again yeah yeah it, it it gets deep and this is like one of those the story behind it is basically these bunch of people got together and uh through their hot local high school they were doing a radio show of them playing this ttrpg and it got so famous that some of them spun it off into careers and all of that but it's basically a like group of people who kind of peaked in high school or at least think that they peaked in high school but then got together for a chance to do a reunion union mm -hmm. and and the gm used this quote-unquote new system that uh warped them into the game and so it deals with a lot of adult issues like thinking that you're not good enough imposter syndrome feeling less 
left out of like the quote unquote popular people mm -hmm. stuff like that but the first story is done I hope they do more it was great Dead Ghost Productions it was a podcast that's it I'm done cool alright okay. now with screen time complete it is time for another segment of the podcast Trailer Talk Trailer Talk is a segment of the podcast where our good boy Brian here has curated a list of six count them six brand new trailers for us to react to and through the magic of editing thanks to our man Tony we will come back shortly with our rapid fire thoughts on said trailers so Brian uh once you uh, also almost forgot to mention uh for the YouTube people exclusively there will be a link to the playlist down in the description but yeah go ahead Brian tell the good folks at home what trailers we will be reacting to tonight all right we got a wide range of stuff it's like three it's like four movies two TV shows but they're all interesting uh this first one is a uh, Calamity Jane it's a movie Ooh. after Wild Bill is killed in a poker game Calamity Jane must break out of prison and seek revenge her quest is hindered by Deadwood's Sheriff Mason who's out to detain and arrest her oh shit it's a kill bill cow it's cowboy kill bill I'm here for this also uh Jay mm -hmm. the cast at least the main three it is a real is a real big uh like flashback nostalgia hit for specifically us oh yeah uh Calamity Jane Emily Bet Richard. Oh shit, Felicity? Nice. Yep. And uh and uh her lost love, Wild Bill, Stephen Amel. Oh, that's a nice oh. reunion. Love it. And even one more, but different show. The villain, uh Sheriff Mason, mm -hmm. Tim Rosin. Oh shit! Doc from Winona Earp. Yep. That's awesome. So even though I think this is like a Tubi original, I still felt like I had to include it. With I that mean cast. Tubi is free. I'm watching. I'm watching. I'm watching this. We all right. We should totally watch this. And then uh, next up, something completely different. Uh huh. I'm probably gonna say this wrong because this is a weird name. Ricky Stenicky. Mm -hmm. And uh, what it is is Ricky Stenicky is the name of an imaginary character invented by three longtime friends as someone to blame for their misbehavior over the past two decades. When their partners become suspicious and demand to meet him, they decide to hire a washed up actor to bring this character to life. Huh? Um, two of the three friends include Zac Efron, stand-up comedian Andrew Dantino, which uh, when you see him, you'll recognize him. I would say that name sounds familiar, but it's not ringing Tall anymore. Tall redhead, dude. Apparently somewhere in the mix, William H. Macy is in the movie. Huh? Okay. And playing the actor portraying Ricky Stenicky, and his name is John Cena. Oh, shit. Yeah, I saw a trailer for this that's cool oh and uh it's directed by one half of the farley brothers oh uh, wow cool uh next up don't really need any explanation for this but don't know if you're caught up on the series but i thought it's a big trailer might as well include it uh despicable me four oh, I, I i said the was three the one with trey parker as the bad guy i think then i'm caught up okay uh, with, uh... then i don't really need to explain that um we all know what it is Yep. Then uh, next up, we have a movie that I didn't see coming, but I am very excited for. Pause. The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Behavior. Oh. Billed as a true story about a secret British World War II organization, the Special Operations Executive, founded by Winston Churchill, their irregular warfare against the word I can't say, helped to change the course of the war and give birth to modern black operations. Huh. This is directed by none other than Guy Ritchie. Dope. And look at this freaking outstanding cast. The lead, Henry Cavill. Damn. Cool. And other cast includes Eliza Gonzalez. Name sounds which, familiar, uh, but not ringing uh, any bells. She's been in multiple things. She was the Hispanic chick in uh, Baby Driver. Oh, that chick. I love her. Yep. Her. Alan Richardson, mm -hmm. aka Reacher, a uh, failed Aquaman, and also uh, Hawk on uh, Time Titans, and also he was on Smallville, uh, wasn't he? Yeah, he was. He's he's in it. Uh, Henry Golding is in it. Hmm. The the male lead from Crazy Rich Asians. Nice. Blast from the past. Alex Edifer. That name sounds super familiar. Uh, movie Jace in Mortal Instruments. Ah. I am number four. That crappy <laughs> Vanessa Hudgens movie. Oh, Beastly. Beastly! Yeah. <laughs> yep, yep, yep. Nah, I remember that guy. Uh, also in the cast is a uh, hero. 
finds Tiffin, the nephew of uh, Rafe Fines, which is funny because uh, this dude got his start playing uh, Tom Riddle. Huh. But modern audiences might also know him as the lead, the male lead in the After series. Ah. And uh, playing Winston Churchill himself, Harry Elways. Hmm. Ooh. Oh. And then also in the film is uh, Freddy Fox, who uh, Jay will know from uh, uh, King Hugo in The Great. Oh, shit. Nice. And the reason why I included him is because you might know the person that he's playing. Oh? Little known person named uh, Ian Fleming. What? Ooh. Oh, oh, shit. Oh, shit. Yes. Oh, man. Wild. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then the next one is... Uh, my, the next one is the two TV shows. Uh, one is uh, Feud. They're doing a new season of I, Feud. I want to see this season so bad. I've seen this trailer. Capote versus the Swan. I really want to see this trailer. For those that aren't Jay and don't know about this, this is the story of True and Capote and his feud with the uh, jet set socialites of New York City. Hi, so society and the cast is insane yep the cast includes naomi watts diane lane chloe Sevigny, calista flockhart demi moore molly ringwald Dude. Jessica Lang and and uh, Russell Trove. I cannot wait for this feud. Betty and Joan was amazing. Sure, it wasn't very accurate, but it was it was very pretty and fun to and, watch. Uh, this trailer is old, but it's coming out soon, so I thought I'd include it. Mm -hmm. And then the last trailer is one that I was anticipating. It is uh, the second best hospital in the galaxy. It is an animated show coming to Amazon, and it is about as the name implied the second best shit my thing is fucking up on me but it is about schleck and clack two brilliant female alien doctors who specialize in rare sci-fi illnesses but one of the reasons why i'm excited mm -hmm. is the cast okay our our two doctors stephanie Shu and kiki palmer Oh, damn. Ooh. Ooh. And uh, the rest of the cast includes names like Natasha Leone, award-winning actor, Kieran Culkin, Maya Rudolph, and Therese Ellis Ross, Rainbow from Black. Damn. But that's our trailers, gentlemen. I'm excited. The, uh, it seems like this is going to be a strong batch. All right, folks, we will be back via the magic of editing. But until then, please enjoy this word from our non-existent sponsors. And we're back. All right, another solid batch of trailers. Uh, Calamity Jane looks really fun. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, it does. I, I think it's, I think it's going to be a blast. If we can cover it, we'll try to cover it. But if not, we're definitely going to watch it together. Yeah. For oh, sure. Yes. Um, the, uh, the other one that we're definitely going to try to cover is uh, the Guy Ritchie movie. Mm -hmm. Holy shit. What was that called? It was called The Ministry of Ungentlemanly Behavior. It looks dope as hell. Love the cast. It, it's oozing mm -hmm. with your classic Guy Ritchie style. You'll love it. It's like Guy Ritchie, but also World War II-y, so it kind of almost gives off vibes of Inglorious Bastards. It's like if Guy Ritchie did, like, a, the few, like, made a property by doing the fusion dance with Inglorious Bastards and League of Extraordinary Gentlemen. Yeah. I definitely, I can definitely see that. Uh, it looks like it's gonna be a blast. Uh, Feud, Feud's new season, looks like it's gonna be so much fun, so messy, I'm here for it. Uh, yep. uh, the, uh, the, the cartoon with the alien doctors looks fun. The premise of a parasite that cures alien uh that cures anxiety or feeds off anxiety i need that i want that parasite mm -hmm. i need that in my life let it possess me also um amazon animation hasn't gone wrong lately so far so, yeah. Uh, yeah so far it hasn't so the fact where we might be talking about that again later hint hint nudge nudge but yeah uh the nikki's to nikki uh we might not it might not be a podcast movie but we, we might have, we're probably gonna watch it together just as a, a fun watch along oh yeah indeed the cast chemistry is um, hilarious oh yeah definitely oh yeah although i will admit i hate to say it gotta dress the elephant in the room efron's face is a little distracting yeah it is but... yeah, I didn't realize if it's efron until you mentioned it like oh now i see it yep which is funny though because it's his boss who they joke on for getting work 
right? Uh, well, yeah, that just looks like a fun little homie hang. Uh, thing. Yeah. Nothing too deep. And honestly, um, I, in, my, in my opinion, Efron's strongest movies have always been his comedies. Oh, yeah. I can agree with you on that one. Mm -hmm. And then uh, the last one is uh, Brick Will Be Four. It looks like a fun premise. Um, Gru trying to bond with his baby that's clearly a mama's boy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A return of the OG villain from the first movie. I don't know if that's him or not. It was. Well, I, I thought it was him because it sounded like him, but it could, you know, could not be. It, uh, I know that it's Will Ferrell voicing him. Mm -hmm. But anyway, either way, they give a reference to the to the meme, Honey Badger Don't Give a Fuck. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It looks fun. Uh, Honestly, I've enjoyed all the Despicable Me movies. Like, you know, they're not high art, but they're a fun time if you, like, have, like, kiddos to watch them with. Mm -hmm. I haven't seen the Minions movie or Rise of Gru. Right. I heard the uh. first Minions movie, I heard the first Minions movie suck and Rise of Gru was actually okay. Okay, but the Minions didn't seem, at least in the truth. Overbearing? Yeah, too. that was the big, yeah, that was the big selling point for me. They didn't, like, but over Minion it. I will say poor whatever his name yeah, was. Yeah, poor Ron. Ron just, keep, Ron just kept Ron. getting abused. Yeah, yeah, that's it for the trailers. Yep. Uh, cu couple things we might cover in the future. Good trailers overall. Oh yeah, for sure, for sure. I can agree. But now, what? it's time for the main event. Campers, are you ready? It's time to talk some Percy Jackson. Alright, so, oh. spoiler free wise, I want to open up by just saying, look, as a fan of the Percy Jackson series, that movie did me so fucking dirty. Those movies, mm -hmm. mind you, because Brian reminded me that the second one does in fact exist. Uh, sea of Monsters. Yep. And, uh, Which man. is technically not an adaptation of Sea of Monsters. It's technically an adaptation of Sea of Monsters up five. until the... It's technically Sea of Monsters through <laughs> Last Olympian. Yep. All in one movie. But yeah, needless to say, those movies were ass. I hated them. I think the cast was well casted if they were younger. Because I think Alexandra Daddario could have been a great Annabeth. And I do mm -hmm. think Logan Lerman was a good choice for Percy if it was 12 year old Logan Lerman from Perks of Being a Wildflower or Wallflower. And I will say he was only in the first one, but Pierce Bronson is Kyra. Yeah, he was cool. Um, We don't need to talk about Brandon T. Jackson's Grover because no. terrible. No. Uh, but yeah, the movie sucked. It didn't get anything right. It wasn't even fun. It just didn't make any sense. No one was even trying. And, you know, over the years, Rick has come out saying, uh, mentioning how like they basically shut him out and didn't let him get involved at all in anything and they didn't listen to any of his suggestions or anything like that so he made sure when he said he made sure with this tv show that he would be directly involved uh it, that was the first ray of hope for me and then the second ray of hope was when we saw the first trailer and we saw them all in the orange camp half blood t-shirts uh mm -hmm. we got to see our first looks at percy annabeth and grover and they were all kids age appropriate and mm -hmm. i i already really liked this kid who plays percy because i really enjoyed the adam project oh yeah he was great in that so like i had a lot of faith in him uh i was not familiar with either of the other two actors who played annabeth or grover but they were phenomenal i think i think annabeth is an unknown and grover was a supporting cast member in one disney channel show hmm, okay cool but uh, yeah overall i was i was super excited going into it and from episode one like these guys can tell you i was pausing left and right be like oh my god they got this right they did this oh yeah this yeah. is just like the book this is just like the book um you know one of the biggest things that i will compliment about the show right off the bat spoiler free wise is they nail the themes right on the head like the theme of family both as fat both for found family and kind of understanding the responsibilities of your family is very well mm -hmm. handled here um it touches on a lot of very classic greek mythological tropes uh and a lot of the characterizations for both the gods and the demigods were so on point uh in particular mm -hmm. some of the big standouts were the edge as Ares. oh yeah. oh my god talk about perfect casting i mean this dude towers over these 12 year olds <laughs> and he gives off this like shit heel fucking whiny baby bitch energy and if you know anything about Ares from greek mythology Ares is a whiny baby bitch mm -hmm. and so he was perfect his back and forth with grover was amazing and his back yeah. and forth with percy is amazing speaking of percy uh this kid matches percy's all smoke attitude so well oh yeah it i mean when his perfect. previous job mm -hmm. was perfectly portraying a young ryan mm -hmm. you knew he you could 
the handle the this. Yeah. University. Oh man, the snark was off the chart. Loved him. Uh, Annabeth's actress. She was wonderful. Yeah, there was controversy because people always just gotta be racist. You can't avoid. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but the important part is Annabeth's actress captured the spirit of Annabeth as a character. She was witty. She was intelligent. But also, she's very arrogant and can easily be blindsided if, you know, things don't fit exactly into her frame of mind. Mm -hmm. And uh, I love it. And of course, I love how they're like, you know, planting the seeds and slow burning the Persebeth train. Here for it. Here for it. And I like that they're being slow about it, not like a, a movie. Yeah, where, where they were like, where they were frenemies in the first movie and all of a sudden they're holding hands ungloved. Yeah. Like savages. Savages. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, but all, yeah. The, mm -hmm. all the guys that we got to see were good. I don't think we can mention the other ones without the spoilers. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, the um, yeah the gods were all very well handled. Uh, I, the effects. Let's talk about the effects. Because like right from episode one, the Minotaur looked great. All the different monsters look amazing. Now it isn't perfect because they do rely on a trick of uh, yeah. When shoot. they're going for their mo most like FX heavy scenes, it's purposefully at night with a uh, low light. But it's understandable because it's a TV budget. But still, with the budget they have, it, everything looks great. Great shit. Some of the some of the effects look better some than some modern Marvel movies. <coughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, I had a bad cough there. My bad. Um, but yeah, the the, the effects for the most part are great. Uh, I want to quickly just touch on spoiler free wise. Their interpretation of Medusa, amazing. Uh -huh. The effects for her were great. Um, just, Jessica Parker Kennedy. Yeah, so so good, phenomenal. Um, and it's just I I really love just kind of how they display the world. The effects for a Olympus looked beautiful. Uh, you know, some of the big set pieces for the notable locations like the Lotus Casino looked great. Uh, but I've yammered on enough. Uh, you guys, what did what did you think of this show, spoiler free wise? Well, I thought I'd go first because mine is kind of in between you and Tony. Mm -hmm. Because um, long, long before I met you, I watched the movies and I thought the first, first one I like because the first one is a good movie if you don't know the source material. Yeah. And I didn't know the source material so i liked the movie then i saw the second one and second one had elements that i liked like having uh, nathan fillion as hermes nathan fillion was a good hermes honestly all the mm -hmm. gods they casted in the movie were great yeah. on paper like rosario dawson as persephone is great and um i'm forgetting his name now but dude that they got to be haiti i feel like he could pull off true haiti oh yeah but instead they made him like a washed up rock star yeah yeah but anyway and that's how they decided to reveal the true form thing mm -hmm. for the plot but anyway um so i had a co-worker back then because i was working around the time mm -hmm. the second movie came out i had a co-worker that was like you jay mm -hmm. he was a uh, very much a uh, super fan of the book mm -hmm. and he was telling me about how good the books were compared to the movies uh-huh so i was like okay and i listened to the first two audio books and i get it i get it i get it a lot and uh the books were great and then to see it on TV for the season one, yeah, it was great. Yep. What we said about the before about the gods, yes, they were really good in the movie, but I think the gods here were even better. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. so we'll we'll Spe get into that in like, the spoilers. Like even if you don't know the books, if you just know their characterizations from Greek mythology, mm -hmm. fucking great. I mean, and I'm sure mm -hmm. Tony can uh, Tony can talk to that when we get to him. So Tony, as a mythology buff, much like myself, you have no real familiarity with the books aside from the movies uh but what did you think of this show as a fan of greek mythology mm -hmm. yeah well for me i like the interpretations that riordan from the books did and from what i understood of riordan's respect for the source material as someone who has a great love for mythology he did his due diligence and the show shows that due diligence mm -hmm. page to screen and also i love that the overall family dynamic of the olympians is still still toxic af it's to yeah it's toxic as fuck it's dysfunctional just as the olympians family dynamic should be also one thing that i love that the riot inverse got right is that you know most of mainstream pop culture gets wrong hades super chill dude 
loved. Not a bad guy at all. <laughs> like, you know, uh, it's like slight spoiler, but like we do meet Hades and, you know, everybody just are automatically assumes, oh yeah, he's the bad guy. He's the devil. He's the ruler of the underworld. You meet Hades. He's like, nah, yeah, uh, uh, you know, I did this to help you guys out. What? Really? Yeah. But don't you want to? No, that's my brother's problem. But don't you want to, you know, take power from your brother? No. Why would I want that? I am eating good here. I got my own kingdom, my own people. I'm rich. Nah, fam. I don't want to deal with his drama. Keep me away, as far away from that as godly possible. Yep, if there's one thing that we all know, Zeus is nothing but drama. Yep. Typical. Mm -hmm. my, like... my little brothers are so annoying. No, I chose to be down here so I could be away from them. <laughs> mm -hmm. yep, um, that's just big brother energy right there. You know, big brother and as a big and as a big brother myself i've always related to hades back uh so like yeah i i love how they've that they got hades right i'm so happy um also one thing i'd like to add mm -hmm. there is so much bombastic side eye of like i am done with your shit right now oh yeah hades gave a lot of that no it's not just from hades oh yeah but for the cast too oh yeah mm -hmm. especially the gods did yeah Maurice did um, it did it yep the kids even did it it was hilarious man oh, oh yeah. well when the kids were just not not putting up with Aries bullshit. It was great. Um, so it is funny to see kids fight kids. Yep, but yeah. And call, calling Edge a child is... Oh, the character Edge played a child is actually quite apropos because Aries is a very sad, very lonely daddy's boy. Yep. That doesn't groove from dad. Yep. Only, uh, mama, Mama's the only one that loves him. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah. I'm getting by your brother. <laughs> oh, man. They captured the troll, like, the troll sibling relationship between Hephaestus and Ares so well. Love that. Yeah. Uh, yeah here, and I ask the question, though. Mm -hmm. Have we spoken enough to get to the spoiler territory? Oh, yeah. Now... Oh, yeah. So, now, now that we've hopefully sold you enough on this, please, go watch the show. If you're a fan of the books, you will absolutely love it. If you like Greek mythology at all, you will absolutely love it. If you just love fun adventure stories, you're gonna love this show. Mm -hmm. Go watch. Highly recommend it. It gets the channel chaser stamp of approval. Uh, oh, yeah. So, um, usual countdown. I'll give you guys a warning for those of you who want to remain spoiler free. Five, four, three, two, one. Spoiler alert. Okay. Holy shit. They did Greek mythology so well. And the the whole looming threat of Kronos. Ah, oh, beautiful. Beautiful. Mm -hmm. Because, and I, and I love what they did here. They use the same framing devices they do in the books. They use the stories that Sally told Percy all throughout his childhood so that Percy wasn't just entirely clueless. He was able to figure this out. He's like, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. If this is really how the cycle goes and everything with, you know, the Greek pantheon is so cyclical, then, oh shit, the bad guy is my grandpa. Yeah, and uh, this uh, really did, like, one of the smaller elements from the books that was really missing in the movies, mm -hmm. and that was the the power of Sally Jackson. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. let, me, let We gotta take a whole section to talk about Miss Sally. Holy shit. Shit. Sally Jackson was amazing. She mm -hmm. not only was she bad as fuck, mm -hmm. like I mm -hmm. I totally understand you, Poseidon. Good taste. But she mm -hmm. she's a certified badass, dude. Mm -hmm. Like she she is such a mama bear that she was willing to just spin in front of a goddamn minotaur to save her baby boy. And that's that's a that's a mama right there. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. And like you could you could tell that like you know she earned respect from even the gods because even Hades was like, I wasn't gonna let your mom die. It's like, mm -hmm. oh, yeah. She like, she stepped in front of a minotaur. That takes balls. Nah, I li mm -hmm. I like her. L besides, yep. your dad your dad doesn't annoy me as much as Zeus. Mm -hmm. I, I, oh yeah. I don't I don't want to see Poseidon's wife be hurt. Also, I can uh, use this to get my damn helm back. Because some Cause that's all I want. Because some some dumb motherfucker decided to steal my stuff. My only rule is don't touch my stuff. And what did they do? They touched my stuff. They stole my shit. I don't care about your stupid little war. I don't, I don't care I don't. about you kids acting up. I don't care. I just want my stuff. I don't care about my I brother. Care. I don't care about my, I don't care about my brothers throwing a hissy fit. That's just always them. As long as they yeah. don't involve the underworld, I'm chilling. And 
I don't care if you have a small ego because you have daddy issue. That's not my problem. I'm not your daddy, but you I just want my stuff. Oh, you say, uh, you know what? You say you can give me my stuff? I, I liked you. I like you, kid. And you got gut. I like the cut of your gym. You know what? Yep. Screw it. Mm -hmm, I'll mm -hmm. send you on a quest. Yep. Oh, stop, stop great. my so being idiots. It was great. But, uh, um, it, it's like that one moment, you know, in any family dynamic. Yep. Where little brothers are just arguing over something stupid. Like, yep. and then, which <laughs> controller to play with. Oh, my God. Mom said it was or... my turn. Do you know how many times I had to deal with that? Oh, yeah. Oh. But, uh. Even I, even when she's not on screen, though, the weight of Sally Jackson. Oh, yeah. Uh, oh, yeah. Her, heard of that moment where, where uh, he's like, I'm not Poseidon's son. I'm Sally Jackson's son. That, like, who the hell is that? That was fucking great. I, it was so beautiful. Um, yes, it was. And uh, one of the other things that I really liked that was very highlighted, very much highlighted in the finale. Um, the thing about the gr Greek mythology as a concept overall, that's kind of been a thing ever since its inception, right? Greek mythology was created to understand the phenomena of the world and so therefore the gods were created to reflect humanity right and so mm -hmm. the gods had their own foibles right they are they have you know untold divine power but they're also very flawed beings and you know percy after going on these quests and learning more about the family dynamics especially for percy as someone who clearly has always wanted a family since it's always just kind of been him and his mom uh he sees yeah you know the gods aren't perfect but i've seen with annabeth and you know others of the gods they're at least trying their best and then especially when he finds out the the struggle and plight of his father of the fact that like you know and can you and like you know we're all adults we're 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 around the we're around the age where we, we could have kids at some point could you just imagine the pain of being a parent and seeing your wife and son constantly struggle but because of your greater responsibility abilities you just have to sit back and watch it is it tugs at the heartstrings a lot there mm -hmm. man yeah it's it's harrowing and once percy understands that struggle and understands that poseidon's not some deadbeat he realizes mm -hmm. man it's not his fault it's just the world kind of sucks also when we do because we are in the spoilers mm -hmm. when we do finally get to see papa poseidon yep uh played by toby stevens really good job uh but we already knew that that guy I could be a really good dad. Yep. Because uh, for those that might recognize his face, he was the dad in the Lost in Space TV show. Yeah, he was great in that. Yup. Loved it. And he was great in this because just that struggle where he he was like, yeah, the look on his face, and she, and she and and she and she was like, you know, do you at least want to hear his voice? And that mm -hmm. little like pitch in his breath and hesitation. Oh my mm -hmm. god. Oh uh, yeah. And then later when he was like, I surrender. Okay. If you just Leave my kid alone. That was fucking beautiful. Yes. Yeah, yes, like, oh, like, and, and just, just, and he didn't even have. He said two words, and instantly Percy was like, he. So he was there for me. And credit to Percy's actor again. Just him being able to sell that with just a look on his face, like Dad. Walter Scoville. Yeah. Yeah. Walter, man, this this kid is gonna go places. And mm -hmm. that whole that whole Provost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Petros. Oh my Petros. God. Petros. That's the only word I I describe. It means. <laughs> father and it's the the look they exchanged i also hats off to the casting department because yeah how close they look alike and especially because the books really emphasize that percy has poseidon's eyes and you really see it oh yeah and like yeah. the eyes on this man his eyes really do look like how they described in the books they look like a storm they're like the sea mm -hmm. they they can they can they can be raging and wild one minute but calm and gentle the next it's fucking mm -hmm. beautiful and uh since we're talking about casting real quick mm -hmm. just also a side note to the casting department because uh young percy holy shit dude right it, it just feels like they like had footage from a time machine that kid it's mm -hmm. fucking great he, he and... looked exactly like walter in the adam project yeah all right listen listen we were all little kiddos once i would be upset too if i was told to go to a new school all because yeah. I saw pool. You're telling me because I drew a cool horse that 
I saw. I got expelled. That I have like behavioral problems or what have you. Yeah, that's, that's BS. Well, also, man. like his father did admit in the finale, he inherited his father's fury of the sea. Yep. Yeah, the sea refuses to be restrained. Love that. Love that. Yeah. And yo, okay. So obviously we gotta address the elephant in the room. Uh, the late great Lance Riddick. Oh my Ab god, man. <laughs> Absolute Pun treasure. intended, Brian. Like, good gods, this man. Look, mm -hmm. look. We all That's knew it. Lance Reddick was an amazing actor. Is an amazing mm -hmm. actor. But, like, here, he had five minutes of screen time. And he only said a handful of words. Uh -huh. But man. once he actually uh -huh. got to talk, he just exuded authority. Mm -hmm. uh, nah, fam. Um, Not even speaking. Man was just mm -hmm. sitting. You could just feel that presence. Like, just if you, just if you all remember. Oh yeah, go ahead, Brian. My bad. I was just gonna say, if y'all remember back in uh, our review of uh, Bloodhounds, mm -hmm. uh, we, especially me, talked about how the villain in that, even before he spoke, and when he was just walking around, he had this aura around him where he was just very intimidating and unsettling. Like we, this is that same kind of thing. Like but, like like weebs. You'll understand that. You'll understand this reference, normies. I'm sorry, you won't get this reference. But Zeus sitting in that throne, literally, I could see the con for menacing just hovering around him like he was a fucking JoJo's character. Oh, so you saw the rumble effect too? Yup. <laughs> Cause like, that's just the vibe he gave off. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And I mean, and I mean, the yeah. ultimate moment of just pure Zeus was mm -hmm. boy! <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh my god. And it, and just the, you know, you have amused me. You won the day. So your prize is you get to live. Take your victory. And then Percy just keeps mm -hmm. talking. And then, you know, we get to, we talked about this moment a little bit, but and he brings down the lightning and just Poseidon shows up and is like, no. Like, no, you can, bro. you can. Because he was going to point blank lightning bolt that. Yep. Oh. He was, he was about to activate Raigeki, and Percy did not. <laughs> Percy did not have magic jammer or or mm -hmm. fucking lightning storm. Nothing to protect his back row. <laughs> Nothing at Nothing. all. And he just had surprise interrupt. Yep, yep. He 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 activated he activated his trap card, Daddy Power. No, no, and, no. Uh, make it more apropos. Solemn judgment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he did activate. Solemn judgment and negated negated Zeus's Raigeki. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. I'm sorry, folks. These are all super nerdy references. Normies, you probably don't understand, but you all you weebs out there in the audience, I hope you got a chuckle out of that. But going back to you're talking about just Lance with the looks. Yeah. When Poseidon was talking to him, and and he, he was like a hey, sired a forbidden child. And then he just throws it back to him. So was Thalia. Yep. And just the look <laughs> on his face, like it's like checkmate. Fuck you, right? It's, but it's, Still, it's like shit. Fuck you. You're right, but fuck you. Yeah. And I, I also just love the confidence and arrogance in his Zeus as well. Like when, mm -hmm. when he's like, "All right, I'll call a meeting with Athena. The entire council will plan my swift and sure victory." I'm like, he doesn't even entertain the idea of him losing. That's mm -hmm. Zeus. Yep. Mm -hmm. This is petty as fuck. And, and they also started and, talking in Greek. Yep, ancient Greek. And I and I also just love his like retorts to Percy. It's like I know where Kronos is. I put him there. I know exactly who he is. I'm his son. It's like ah, uh, so good. Mm -hmm. Also, let's talk about the other major villain uh, in this first season. Luke. Luke was done so well. They made him so likable mm -hmm. in, in this uh, first season. So when the rug gets pulled it hurts so much more and i mean you don't need to say anything more than just the look on annabeth's face when she takes off her cat after luke has his villain monologue revealing his plan mm -hmm. and she just says annabeth and she has her sword at the ready and says i heard everything and he doesn't you know put up a tough front he runs away because he's like mm -hmm. shit it's like not she says i heard everything and then enters a fighting stance with her sword and he's just like fuck shit gotta get out of here yep bam because it's like, not only is this my little sister, but she's trained against me more than anyone. She knows how to fight me. And two, I'm still a little iffy on this whole bad guy thing. I don't know if I could kill my little sister. Yeah. Which, I'm glad they also show that, right? The layers to Luke. Because Luke isn't just uh -huh. an evil, you know, traitorous bad guy. <laughs> he, has a he has a legitimate reason, and it makes sense to an extent, right? Because, we, you know, we 
talked about how Percy has the realization that his their parents are trying their best. But to people like Luke, and especially within Luke's specific uh, situation, right? Uh, because we find out, and you find out this in the books as well, that Luke's mom uh, is a seer. She is someone who is actually gifted to be able to pierce the veil despite being a mortal. So she can see through the mist. Now, this, you know, in ancient times is you know, a gift and a blessing and, you know, brings you a lot of fame mm-hmm. and fortune. In modern times, you just look like a fucking psycho. And you know how in the books, uh, it's never stated out loud, but it's heavily implied. Um, Luke's mother went to dealing with her sight. Drugs. Heavy drugs. It's never said out loud. Uh, so, you know, don't make me, uh, don't mis- don't mistake me by saying, oh yeah, it's confirmed that Luke's mom was a crackhead. No, uh, it's heavily implied and it's definitely a read between the lines thing, but you can tell, like, you know, Luke's mom was had been through some shit. And very much like Poseidon, Hermes, especially given the role Hermes is, because I don't, one thing I think Luke doesn't understand is Hermes isn't just some mailman. Hermes has one of the most important jobs in the entire Greek pantheon. He, you know, ferries every message between all the gods, and he also helps to ferry lost souls to the underworld. He is one of the most important psychopomps in the entire Greek pantheon. So, of course, Hermes cannot be as directly involved as he wants. And kudos to Lynn for his performance because you he really sells the damage and the toll that it's taken on Hermes and you know uh, Hermes shows that he clearly wants to help because he you know he doesn't even mm-hmm. put up a fight when trying to help them he he lets them steal his car well and I love that though because he does that by leaving a note on his thing saying idiot kids yep uh, but yeah and just like the complex of like the sorrow arrogance and like wanting to help all at the same time also the like two little subtle flexes that he did Mm -hmm. like one with the teleporting them yep and then the second one where he's like you gotta time is running out it's like oh yeah by the way i've uh i've paused time for our entire conversation but uh I, it's running again my my so well though can only last for five seconds yep poor rover <laughs> yeah uh, i'm sorry y'all. i'll be making jojo references all throughout this i if if i ever get an opportunity to make jojo references i'm gonna make jojo references so will tony uh, run. but yeah uh but but yeah um luke luke was great if you didn't watch the, if you didn't read the book, they made it maybe a little bit too obvious. Yeah, like even even without reading the books, just knowing TV, super obvious. I mean, there's a traitor. There's a traitor. Boom, hologram call, Luke. Yeah, and like, and right before that, you have a dream where you see the traitor, yeah. at least the silhouette. Who do you see right after that? Oh, hey, it's Luke. Oh, the yeah. prophecy says you're going to be betrayed by somebody you call a friend clearly Annabeth and Grover aren't gonna betray you hey who what other friends have you made at camp oh yeah there's only one other one which I do like that uh Percy oh yeah yeah he finally used his two brain cells good for you seaweed brain Mm -hmm. and I say that with all the love in the world Mm -hmm. they don't say it but you can kind of tell that Annabeth didn't believe it but went along with it oh yeah because as smart as she is she she does have her blind spot yeah she's but yeah she was she definitely didn't believe it at first until she heard it right out of Luke's mouth Oh yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Um. But when she did, oh boy, was she gonna look for blood? Oh yeah. And oh, also speaking of blood, the fight with Ares was great. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just uh, interspersing it with uh, Percy's training with Luke, and then just him getting that first blood by being like, "Oh nah, you done fucked up, cause you're in my house mm-hmm. now." And uh, they maybe overall with the fight scenes did maybe a little bit too many quick cuts, mm-hmm. but I do like the fact that they were presented that they're 12 years old and probably wouldn't know too much about fighting. Yep. Also, the other, uh, one of my only other complaints about the show is I feel like the show was a little too action heavy. Like, mm-hmm. I do, wi- like, I loved all the subtle, quiet character moments that we got, but I wish we got more of those. Like, mm-hmm. I get it. You want to have a lot more action to keep people's interest, but I hope that within season two, now that people are so invested in these characters that we'll get more of the characters character stuff yeah because um, i think that was the biggest strength of this show i don't know about you guys oh yeah indeed and uh one of the 
thinks that uh because there were some moments that i really liked but i wish they had gone on for longer like um like um the whole thing with medusa oh yeah that was a little too quick yeah also i know this is probably a little bit of bias because i love the actor mm-hmm. but i wish we had gotten more with hephaestus yeah same but i get why because he's a major player later on so like they, they mm-hmm. just wanted to intro him but i did love what we did get with the uh with the net trap and the music behind it the, what is love mm-hmm. <laughs> oh, so good and then annabeth like admitting everything and saying that like he's not like them and i was like them but i don't want to be like them yep and then he's like oh and you talk about facial acting that dude too he was like oh shit these kids might not suck okay <laughs> i'll let him go oh shit did i find members of my family that i actually like the gasp mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. uh but yeah um any uh final thoughts on the show because i feel like we pretty much said all we had to, uh, we've had to say for real mm-hmm. um it's not a not a perfect show the, it does have little things wrong here and there but over but overall i did really enjoy it and like you said the the way that it like succeeds and it's like biggest strength is the actor and the uh the like subtle acting moment yep all right so with that let's go ahead and go to ratings we'll start with tony then we'll go to brian and we'll end on me tony kick us off my friend Mm -hmm. i'll have to say just to rip off the band-aid this show is a nine Mm -hmm. that's it all right i've already said what i need to say and just the spoiler and non-spoiler stuff short sweet and to the point i like it all right brian yeah we we kind of like gave our final thought in our actual thought you know what that's fair so brian radix okay so uh like i said not completely perfect but close to it so for me who's a casual fan of the book and all that i think i will have to give it a 9.5 all right you guys saw this coming you guys saw this coming you already know what it is and i'm not even gonna pretend like this isn't biased it's biased as fuck sue me Mm -hmm. 10 out of fucking 10 you have no idea how long i have waited to see one of my favorite series growing up as a little middle schooler be done justice and these guys can tell you each and every week we watch an episode Mm -hmm. of this show i had the biggest fucking grin on my face this was magic to me was it perfect no as a tv show it definitely was not perfect there were some problems with it and i think there were a little bit of pacing issues here and there but as a Mm -hmm. fan and capturing the magic of this story perfect absolutely perfect i mean if there's Mm -hmm. like one homie hang moment that i wish that i could relive it was to see your reactions in the first step so oh my god Uh, you were so happy but also genuinely shocked yeah uh, because like look folks if you listen to this podcast for long enough you know that i have high expectations for things that i love and i am red i am quick fast in a hurry to shit on something if they fuck up something that i love Mm -hmm. and the fact that i have been so nice to this show should show you how good this show does to its fans and its fan base Mm -hmm. and how much they respect and love this source material and this amazing world that i have grown up in i was 12 years old when i started reading these books and i was about but i and i was 15 16 when the last book at the time came out i was the same age as percy all throughout the timeline of the main series it honestly feels really weird that i am like at least five or six years older than percy is right now in the current book uh but yeah so percy himself means a lot to me he's he's been a character that i've always related to that i've saw myself in not just because of like the fact that i have adhd but that also helps uh but just his personality and his energy is fucking me these these gentlemen have known me for a decade plus they can tell you mm-hmm. i mm-hmm. am very much a percy like person oh uh, oh yeah sure although i feel like yeah. i would be a hades child <laughs> uh, yeah but yes uh the show's beautiful i need season two like yesterday normally we would speculate on what we would like to see in season two but since we th- this show has had such a great faithful track record i can't really talk about it because i know what's gonna happen in season two for the most part i have and i have vague memories of what's gonna happen because i read the book like 10 years ago yep or more so what wh- so with that uh we're pretty much wrapped up so all that leaves is uh hey brian what the hell are we gonna talk about next week well it's funny you say that jay because we are going from one underworld to another we are checking in we are leaving camp and checking in 
to the Has Been Hotel. Gentlemen, I don't know about you, but I think next week will be a happy day in hell. Oh yeah. All right. I hope you guys are looking forward to our review of Busy Pops' Disney musical for adults, Has Been Hotel, mm -hmm. season one. I know we're looking forward to the finale coming up uh, this Friday as of recording this video. So oh, yeah. definitely look forward to that. We hope to see you soon and we hope to see you the next time camp is in session. But for now, we'll catch you later. This has been an episode of the Channel Chasers podcast. Peace.